You know what's cool about that particular song? I don't know how much you know about it, but um, that song was originally written in the kind of mid-19th century. It was a German hymn is what it, what it was. And then it got brought into English and kind of revised in the mid-20th uh, century. And then it just exploded in the Billy Graham Crusades with, I don't know how many of you remember, like uh, George Beverly Shea, you know, some of those realities of, but uh, man, that, there are certain songs like maybe Amazing Grace that cross generations. And that's one of those songs that, man, just those powerful lyrics that tell us about the incredible reality of who God is and why it is we can, we can live this life with such joy and contentment and satisfaction and expectation is because of who our God is. And so, anyways, that was just, I don't know why I said that. That was free. <laughs> that was free, right? Because you already gave the offering. So if, <laughs> not to undercut what Christian just said. I'm, I'm totally kidding. Um, but here's where we are. We're, we're looking in the book of Matthew. Um, we've been, we're going to teach through it. Uh, we're currently right now on the Sermon on the Mount. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can open up there to chapter 6. We're going to be in 25 through 34. But we're going to be talking about this, this idea of anxiousness and worry. Now, let me just confess to you off the front end that the person speaking to you right now probably isn't the best person to be speaking to you about anxiousness and worry because I'm one of those people that I'm a duck. I look calm and serene on the top, but I'm one of those people internally that just battles in an ongoing way with, with anxiousness in different ways. So the schedule fell this way, so you're going to get a guy struggling maybe versus someone that maybe God's done the work of, of maturity in their life. But I would say this, just to kind of talk about it. The whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is given to people not because we have the capacity, but because God is going to transform his people to have the capacity. In other words, this righteousness that needs to exceed that of the Pharisees is not something we can muster within ourselves, but is a work of God that transforms us into the people that are made able to live in this kind of way. So that's really important. I am so thankful. I bank on that all the time. Because if Todd had to arrive there on his own, Todd would never arrive there. But I am so thankful that what God begins, he finishes in our lives. And so just to, to even just laud the Lord Jesus, thankful for that. But I would even add this. The difficulty of this particular text is that oftentimes people have this idea of God there joining me in my adventure. The Sermon on the Mount, in a very powerful way, reminds us, this is not your adventure. This is God's adventure. And he's inviting you to join him in what he's doing. And so when we look at these particular texts, just, just, we got we to gotta, we gotta grapple with that, that even when we start to talk about something like anxiousness or anxiety, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't want us wrongly anxious. Isn't that amazing? He's setting it up where he's talking about it. I'm seeking to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. But one of the realities about my disciples that I want them to know is I don't want them anxious wrongly. I don't want them stressed out. I don't want them freaked out. I want them to be the people that I intend them to be. And so that's where we're going right now. We're talking about what does it mean to apprentice with Jesus as we go through the book of Matthew. But let me, let me read the texts that we're going to be in today to kind of give us a running start. And uh, then we'll, we'll walk through it. But here's what Jesus says in verse 25 of Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which really of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his or her span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you 
Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, I remember one time I was, I was speaking on this to a group of students at a camp, and this guy comes up to me afterwards. And he's like, I could tell he wasn't a follower of Jesus. But he's like, man, this Jesus dude, he's, man, he's a sage. And I go, well, really? I go, why do you say that? He's like, oh, man, he's like, this is like better than Gandhi kind of stuff. <laughs> now, let me just make sure you understand this. Jesus is more than a sage. Jesus is one who is truly God, truly man, who came and lived amongst us. And when he's preaching about what this is, he's telling us the identity of what his kingdom is to look like and will be like. He's laying out this beautiful picture of what he is building when he says, I will build my church. Now, I think in this, again, like I said earlier, it comes from this place of a transformed life. That's the only place it can come. But this word that you're going to find there, so in verse 25, oops, I didn't keep up, did I? Just yell at me next time when I don't keep up. But in there, you're going to see like in verse 25, if you've got your Bible in front of you, if not, you can see it on the screen, verse 27, verse 28, verse 31, verse 34, six different times he's going to tell us anxious. Now, let, let, me, let me give you a Bible study secret. If ever a word is repeated more than three times, that's the point. That's what he's after. Now, in this particular context, he uses this Greek word, merimnao, which is just to be care or concern or intent. But what's fascinating about this particular word is that it's not always negative. Now, in this context, in 625 through 34, it is negative, but sometimes it's used in the positive. So let me, let me give you an example. Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, starts talking about Timothy. And in verse 20, he says, look, I have no one like him who will be genuinely, and there's that word used, concerned for your welfare, a very positive context to it. When he's writing to the Corinthians about how the body of Christ is supposed to care for one another and to treat one another, he brings up this idea that the members maybe have the same, and there's that word, it's miramanao, it's the word we get anxious from in this text, but it means care for one another. And even, I would say, like, probably my favorite epistle just to read on my own, 2 Corinthians, Paul's writing in this particular context, he's talking about the fact that, man, he was beat up, he was left for dead, he was all these different things, but he said, you want to know the thing that probably keeps me up at night is the daily pressure of me in regard to these, just my anxious concern, my, my love for all the churches. So it's used in a very positive context. There's another side of it, though, that it's used negative. Remember in, in Matthew 13, we'll get there in a little bit, but Jesus was telling a parable about the sower that goes, and he's throwing grain out to grow, and one falls on the side of the road, the birds come and get it. One falls in the shallow soil, it grows and dies because it withers. And then there's the other one that falls into the good soil, but in this particular context in Matthew 13, it talks about one that fell amongst weeds, and he's going to use this word, and he says, as for this, what, what was sown among thorns, these weeds... This one who hears the word of God, but look at that, the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, that's kind of a clarification, just choke it out and it proves unfruitful. In other words, he's using it in a negative connotation. Another place that it gets used in, is in the book of Luke, in Luke 10. And I don't know if you guys remember, this is seriously one of my favorite stories in all of the Gospels, is you've got Mary and Martha, right? And Jesus shows up to their house, and you know they were buzzing about the fact that, hey, we're going to have Jesus at our house. So if it's anything like how I grew up or if, at my particular house, if somebody's coming over, we're cleaning up and we're making everything great. But we get this picture of two different women. One is Martha, who's frantically working around, making sure everything is set and ready to go. And then there's Mary just chilling at the feet of Jesus. Martha comes in and tattletales on her. It's like, oh, Jesus, uh, you know, that doesn't work for me. And he says into it, Martha, Martha, you're anxious. You got the wrong care and concern. You're, in fact, that word troubled means to be divided. It means to be unquieted in our spirit. He says, but in that, understand that this particular juncture, Mary, she actually chose the right thing. So it's used in a positive context and it's used within a negative context. Now what that means is, is deep within us, and this is important for us to get inside of our head, is that deep within us, God has made us to be people that care. We care for things. 
We're to be caring for the right things, not the wrong things. That's the kind of the point of what he's talking about here, is that make sure that you are care, concerned, anxious, worried about the right things, not the wrong things. And why that is so important to highlight is that oftentimes whenever I hear people talk about don't be anxious, all they do is they look at you and they say, don't be anxious, stop it. Okay, just stop. It's that idea of don't think about pink elephants. Well, what do you think about pink elephants? In fact, whenever I hear people talk about this, sometimes my anxiety goes up. Okay, stop. What am I doing wrong? There's got to be something wrong with this. There's got to be something. Missing the fact that what is going on inside of us as people that live in a fallen world is we're twisted. And so Jesus isn't saying just don't worry. He's saying actually worry about the right things. And so what happens is they tell us not to worry, and then we're like, okay, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And that freaks us out when they should be saying, no, no, don't worry about this, but I want you to focus over here. It's a place in which we put that care that becomes so important that Jesus is going to show us within this context. Now, I'm not going to get there yet because that would kill the hook at the very end of this. It gets us all excited. But what I want to do is ask the question, what does Jesus mean by being anxious? Well, in verse 25, he uses this word, and you can look down in there and see it. He uses this word, therefore. Now, any good Bible student knows that when we come to the word therefore, we ask what? What's the therefore, therefore? It's a a basic Bible context. Now, he's not using a normal use of this word, therefore. He's using another one that kind of has more of this idea of because of this or for this reason. And he's beckoning us to say, "Well, well, what reason, Jesus? Well, that word oftentimes then takes us back to the verse before. And so when you get down into verse 24, look there with me. The big context of it is just you cannot serve two masters. In fact, the reason that you become wrongly anxious is because you're serving two masters. One of my first jobs in college was at this place called Bob Ward's Sporting Goods. And they had co-managers. Mess. And so one manager would come into my section and he would tell me to do one thing. And then the next manager would come into my section and tell me to do another thing. And all day long, I had no clue what I was supposed to do because I was serving two masters. Now what Jesus is trying to get across to us though is not just that you know you got co-masters going on in here because Jesus don't play games. Jesus isn't a co-master. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He shares his glory with no one. Our problem is is we take we take the cheaper. And so in this context you can see this you cannot serve God and what's the cheaper? Money. That's the illustration that he's talking about in this case. The idea that he's really getting at is what masters you. Now, on one level, we hate that as Americans because we're like, oh, there ain't nobody that masters me. I am a lion, not a sheep. (laughs) But let me tell you this. The Bible is clear. You are always being mastered by something. You're either being mastered by sin in the flesh or you're being mastered by a good king, King Jesus. Now, the problem with this master other than Jesus that we can tell about is that when our affections, our heart begins to go to this wrong master, this wrong master is a deceptive, evil master. He's deceptive from the standpoint, and the way that I would put it like, is like an abusive lover. He's the one that tries to get you to come to him, and he's deceptive and in lies. And the moment that you get hurt and you say, I'm never coming back to you again, he, he tells you, no, 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 I won't do it again. So you come back, and what does he do? He does it to you all over again. Jesus says that master has no end, but later he's going to talk to us in Matthew 11, but he says, take my yoke upon you. My load is easy. It's light. I'm a good master. Now, one of the questions I always ask myself on what's mastering me is, what do I love the most? That's one of those things in there. I can always kind of find out what's mastering me by asking the question, well, what, 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 what do I love the most? It might even be one of those things where I ask the question, what do I fear? Or even two, I'll be honest with you, probably when I ask the most, it's what do I fear losing? What dictates my actions? What do I think about most? 
Now with this, I think what Jesus is doing is, is when he says this idea of not be anxious, he's drawing into verses 25 through 34 this idea that we need to cease having this love affair with deceptive and abusive masters, which is anything other than him. If I make anything my master, that is an idol, and that idol that talks about in Psalm 124 will eventually take us in like a snare and squash us like a bird. But he says, I'm a good master. That's where he's kind of going out there. It's the idea, of like, uh, I think it's in Ecclesiastes 5.10 where it talks about this idea of the love of money. You'll never be satisfied with it. I think you can put anything in there. The love of your kids above God, you'll never be satisfied with it. The love of a spouse above God, you will never be satisfied with it. The love of anything besides God, you will never, ever be satisfied with it. Which brings us, I would say, in this case, to the next aspect of how do they abuse us? How do they, how do they mistreat us? Well, in verse 19, it gives us another clue because Jesus is basing it upon that, is we have this tendency to lay up for ourselves treasures on earth instead of treasure, or treasure, yeah, treasure on earth versus treasures on heaven. And then our heart follows after that. This is what Christian talked about last week. Now, this one is a kind of a it's, a, it's a funny one. It keeps us frantic in a way that I'll give you as an illustration. When my kiddos were little, and I won't tell you which one, but one of my kiddos wanted to make a sand castle. But one of the things that they told me is, is I want my sand castle to have a view of the ocean. <laughs> totally understandable, right? Like, I want my sand castle to have a view of the ocean as well. So we go down there, and we make the sand castle, and I made it a ways back, and my, my kid looks at me and goes, oh, no, Dad closer. I go, well, but if we make it closer, you know, the waves come in and knock, not my castle. Oh, I go, but you know, I did this with your sibling. Yeah, but I'm better. <laughs> All right. That child went right down next to the water and built a sand castle and the wave came in and knocked it down. And that child went back again and again and again and again and finally, I had to rescue that child from the tyranny. <laughs> but this is what this master does to us. You can do it. You are the one that can handle this. You can build your little K kingdom, and your kingdom will last. These things that you're pursuing after will last, but we know this, it just erodes. And after a while, there's this frantic nature of our care going towards things that we can never keep up. They're just constantly being knocked down by the waves of life, but yet our master, he's taking us back to it over and over again. And I think this is what Jesus is saying. In order to not be anxious, you need to cease the frustration of pursuing unstable and vain treasures. Now, I use the word vain because this is what Solomon talked about, especially like in Ecclesiastes. He's talking about this idea of vain. It's this, this Hebrew word, habel, which speaks of this idea of just a vapor. It kind of, you spray the bottle and it just makes a vapor and it's gone again. And he just said, those types of things, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow. And Jesus is saying to them, when your master begins to get you to do that, you just become frustrated beyond all comparison. But the reason we do that, I believe, is found in Matthew 6.19, or excuse me, 6.22, where he talks about the idea that the reason we do it is where the eye is focused. That's where the therefore is going back to. It's oftentimes that the eye, when we focus it on certain things, he says, and there it'll be light, and we focus on another one, it'll be darkness. Christian laid this out, so I'm not going to go into it a whole lot. But I think one of the greatest things that we do is we fuel our wants and our desires, our dreams. I think that's really what it's at in the wrong place. But the problem is the moment that our dreams are dashed, we are crushed. I remember two or three years ago talking to a young man and came in and we were talking about this idea of this girl that was the girl of his dreams. The girl to end all girls and we were going to get married. And she left him like a cheap suit, <laughs> dashed. But we can put any of those things in front of us. His point is, is that this evil one gets us to think that we can build things that are stable, but they're unstable by focusing us, focusing us on dreams and goals and desires that will never meet the satisfaction of the only one true desire that will ever meet our satisfaction, and that is God. We as humans, to place upon a treasure something that only God can handle, it will always, always devastate us, period. And so Jesus is saying to them, 
In order to not be anxious, you need to cease the absolute emptiness of just fixating upon deceptive dreams and desires, things that can never live up to something that only God can. You're like, dang, that's a lot of things to be bringing into this verse from therefore. That's why we study God's word. We draw those things in with us, but then Jesus is going to say now that based upon that, based upon what I want you to draw in with me so that you understand what I'm talking about in regard to this idea of do not be anxious, those three things need to be brought in with us to this so that we get the idea of what he's trying to get across to us. And he says, don't be anxious. Now again, oftentimes we stop there. Hey, just quit being anxious. I'm so thankful Jesus doesn't, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount go, and uh, just don't be anxious, let's pray. <laughs> People will be like, what? Well, he's going to give us a clue here using the word about. He's going to say, don't be anxious, and then the key is he's going to say about your life and about your body. And you're like, dang, well, don't I kind of need to think about my life and my body, especially when he brings up this idea of what I will eat or what I will drink or the clothes that I put on? Don't I need to think about that? Well, I think he's talking about something in this context that's way bigger than just this idea of, you know, me having to work, because we talked about this when we taught through 1 Thessalonians, you don't work, you don't what? Eat. So he's not, he's not referencing there. I think the clue is found in Luke 12, and I want to read this to us so we can see this and kind of understand what Jesus is talking about. Because in Luke 12, right after verse 21, he goes into a statement that is very, very similar to what's being said in this particular context. So in verse 16, it says, he told him a parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, ah, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, I'll build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain <coughs> and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared Whose will they be? Now, here's the key to, I think, understanding this. Verse 21, so, in the, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich to God. Oh. I'm going to read verse 21 again now that it's up there. Listen to this. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I'm going to lay it up for myself, and I think at the essence of it is this idea. I'm going to lay it up for myself so in an interesting way, no matter what God does, I will be protected. I'll make myself safe. I'll make myself secure. About 10 or, I don't know, 12 years ago, these college students that were EBC, they were part of my class, and I was teaching 1 Corinthians, so we were talking about prophecy, and they went to go hear this guy, and he gave a prophecy that a cataclysmic event was about ready to happen all over the area of Southern California, and we needed to prepare. And I said, well, okay, what are we supposed to do? Well, I think we're supposed to, and this is what they said to me, we're supposed to get guns so we can hunt, we're supposed to get ample amount of rice. We're supposed to get water. We're supposed to get all these different things. And I said, okay, stop. Let's go back to one of the words you used. Cataclysmic. What does cataclysmic mean to you? Oh, impossible to live through. Then what in the world is a gun and some rice going to do in a cataclysmic <laughs> event? Now, I bring that up from this standpoint still to bring it back. You understand that our food system and our water system is just a facade that could fall apart tomorrow. You get that, right? Like that, everything could fall apart because we know, but we know this, that the one who supersedes it all, the one who controls water and food and clothing is God. We just lull ourselves to sleep and think, oh, I know, I just go to the grocery store. Really? Can I take you back to COVID? Remember toilet paper? I mean, our world was about ready to end because it was like, we got no Charmin. <laughs> Gather the church to pray. You know what I mean? It's just like, what? It can end like that. 
we can start to think our great thinking and our great systems. Now, again, I'm not anti-thinking and preparing and putting stuff together. But if you honestly think that in that way we can control things, we're lying to ourselves. I think it comes up with the ways in which we think about retirement. I had the most amazing example from one of my grandparents. I remember watching them as they saved for retirement. In fact, when they retired, they sat all of us kids down, all the grandkids, and this is what they said to us. Hey, just so you know, we're not giving you any inheritance. <laughs> everyone's fine, everyone's taken care of. We're gonna make sure that we finish our life well. They went and got a motorhome, got all kinds of things, lived simple. My grandpa was still going up ladders in his late 80s to work with hard hats for Christ. Why? He set aside to be involved in the Lord's work. He set aside to make sure that the Lord's work was taken care of. He made sure all of us were fine, and we were. We had degrees. We had different things. As opposed to somebody else that I recently talked to as they sat there and cried and talked about the fact I prepared myself for retirement. I didn't realize all I was doing was preparing myself for pickleball, golf, and drinking. <laughs> See the difference? At the core of it is the heart behind it. I think God provides. I, I love this next section, right? I, I, don't you ever just wish sometimes you were there when Jesus preached certain things? Like when he just all of a sudden gets done, you know, everybody's like, don't worry. And all of a sudden he goes, like, look at the birds. Right, when you think about that, like he said, look, they neither reap nor gather into barns. He's like, no, humans can do that. They don't even do that. Yet you get the fact that your heavenly father feeds them, right? What about weeds? Well, when it comes to clothing, you get that God, man, he makes things look beautiful. One of my favorite things to do is to go into Wyoming right after spring up in these high meadows that are in what's called the, the, the Titcomb Basin because it just loads up with these flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow. Now, I think he's doing something to ask us some questions that are important to us to understand about what does it mean now to be one who is anxious, one question that he asks us is, look, he says in there, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Meaning you get that life is more than what we eat and drink and put on. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be bigger than just that or else we're, and this is the way I would say it, then all we are is just a bunch of animals. He's making a statement that humanity is way greater than the animals, way greater than the plants. He's one, he and she are created in the very image of God. Do you get that? <laughs> Look at the next one, verse 26. Are you of not more value than they are? He's placing something upon us that no matter what you think about yourself, this is what God thinks about you. He sees the value in you because he placed his image on you. Love at the end of it, will he not much more clothe you? I was talking with one of my kiddos recently, and this was their words. I've got no clothes. <laughs> so I walked them into their room. I opened the closet. And I said these exact words. Ta-da! <laughs> now what we mean by no, no clothes are, I would prefer to wear something else. But part of me wanted to go, I will take all those clothes and here is your loincloth. <laughs> But I, I didn't. I didn't do that. I think the issue is that God knows his system. He created it. He knows every hair on our heads. He knows every flower in the field. He knows all these different realities. And yet at the core of it, he created them. And he's wanting humans to understand, do you get who you are? You're not just anybody. If you're sitting here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, on first blush, I want you to get this. God has placed his image on you, which makes you immensely valuable. The reason last month we talked about this whole issue of human trafficking is because every one of those humans that are being trafficked aren't just anybody. They are boys and girls, men and women created in the image of God. Why we talked about the CPC in December is not just because we were bored and wanted to talk about abortion. At the core of it is the audacity to kill somebody created in the image of God. Oh, we're image bearers. 
This whole thing was designed to support his image bearers. You've been crowned with glory, it talks about in Psalm 8. Oh. And doesn't it make sense that if God created the world, if God created everything and he knows how it works, he created you and he knows how you work, doesn't it make sense I can actually then trust that God? That makes sense. That's the line that he's drawn here. So in other words, what does it mean to not be anxious? Let me add this one to it. Ceasing the humiliation of degrading oneself to mere animals by just going through the motions of life. We're bigger than that. But I want to show you something else. In those questions, in verse 27, he says, which of you can be, by being anxious can add one single hour to his span of life? The answer is nobody. Next question, but if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Meaning, do you get our God cares? And let me, let me give you three words to think about because this is what it is. We, we, we have this tendency to lower God to our level and we've got to be very careful of that. Now in this particular passage, he's going to talk about the idea of God being caring. He's going to talk about God being unlimited in his ability and he's going to talk about God being purposeful. Now, this is what I asked myself. What happens if God is caring and unlimited, but purposeless? Well, then he's a watchmaker. He's the deist understanding the world is correct. Where God comes in, he starts the whole world and steps back and just lets it flow. He doesn't care in the least about us. Or pur- there's no purpose to it. Here's another one I thought of. Caring limited but purposeful well that makes god a superhero without a sidekick that was kind of what our most of our founding fathers had this idea they were theistic rationalists that thought that man isn't it good that we get to come alongside of god to help him to make things better missing the fact god don't need us how about this one caring but limited and purposeless well that's a senile grandparent And I'm not trying to even be like demeaning to anybody, but then that makes God someone that has no ability and doesn't even know where he's going. How about uncaring, unlimited, but purposeful? Well, that makes God a wicked sovereign. How about this one? Uncaring, unlimited, but purposeless. The Greek gods. How about uncaring, limited, but purposeful? Serial killer. (laughs) Uncaring, limited, and purposeless. Gremlins. (laughs) But here's where I want to get to. Our God is caring. He's unlimited. And he's purposeful. See, that changes everything. That's who our God is. That's why Jesus is able to say, therefore, in verse 30, 31, don't be anxious. Your God is caring. He has absolute love for you. Your God is unlimited in his capacity and ability. Your God is purposeful. He causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Your God, at the end of the day, who is caring and purposeful and intentional and loving, can't be stopped. See, I think at the end of it, this is where it gets important. See, all those different things I put up for you before that were back here, see those different things? He would say to them, that's how the Gentiles think. That's not you. The Gentiles have a view of God, and if you wonder why Gentiles live the way they do, it's because they don't see the world through the lenses that our God is caring, our God is purposeful, our God is truly one that is unlimited in his capacity and ability to do anything. Now, the thing I love is, this is where it's so important. He now doesn't stop and go, let's pray. Remember I told you before, he's told us all the things we need to take our hands off, but we need to know what to put our things, hands on. So what he's going to tell them is, I'm going to go past this one. Don't look at that. Okay. <laughs> Verse 33, what are we supposed to do? But seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness. No, 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 what are we supposed to do? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. No, 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 like, like really, Todd. Seek first his kingdom, seek first his righteousness. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, I wanted to show you a clip, but I couldn't from a movie. I don't know if you may remember City Slickers. I couldn't because there's a bad word in it, but like, I, and, yes, I did watch it. But there's this thing where Jack Palance and Billy Crystal are on a horse together. And like Billy Crystal's like trying to wax through life and he's like, you know, curly Jack Palance, you've got it all figured out. What is it? And he starts talking to him about the cowboy way of life. And all of a sudden he says this, when you ask him, what, what, do we, what do I do? He goes, this is what Jack Palance says, there's just one thing. And Billy Crystal, you could tell us like, one thing, what is it? There's just one thing. Finally, what is it? He said, well, that's for you to figure out. But once you figure it out, <laughs> nothing else matters. But I would say this, we have figured it out. There's one thing. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things he said will be added to you. God's like, you understand this, I've got you. I think the ultimate question of this really is, do you trust God? Do you trust him? Now again, this doesn't mean that we're not supposed to provide for our families and go to our jobs. I don't want anybody thinking, well, cool, then tomorrow I'm not going to work. <laughs> because then we'll have to teach the other side of this, you don't work, you don't eat. But there's this reality now in how I look at life. God what is it that you're doing in this world and how do I join you? But I love how he's going to connect this. You can see this. Well, what are these things that are going to be added to you? Well, part of it is, is you're going to get the things that you need, not always the things that you want. He's going to take care of us in the way that's best for us like a dad, right? I mean, my kiddos, they love it when my wife leaves because I'm always trying to earn my children's affection by giving them things. I'm kidding. I don't. My kids hate it when my wife leaves. But they're always like, oh, you know, dad, can we have candy now that mom's gone? And I'm like, well, no, because when I was a kid, I didn't get no candy. <laughs> but there's just this side of it, right, where it's like knowing what's best for my kid. No, eat your vegetables. They don't taste good. Well, here's more. You know, I like, oh. But ultimately, with the reason that God is doing it, we find out through the rest of the Old Testament, or the New Testament is, is his goal in life. His goal is to not make you rich. His goal is to not make you wealthy. His goal is to not make you healthy. His goal is to not make you all these things that sometimes Christian preachers on TV tell you about. His goal, according to Romans 8, is to transform you into the image of his son. The greatest gift that God can give to us is transformation into the image of Jesus. And so the things that he gives us are for that very purpose. So when he talks about this idea then of tomorrow, that's why he says again, why worried about it? Don't. God's got tomorrow. Be present today. I think that's what he means by, oh, you little faith. Today, right now, do you see what God is doing in your life? There's plenty of troubles that are going to come tomorrow, but for today, be present in this day to ask the question, what does it look like today to join Jesus in his kingdom, in his righteousness, today to join Jesus in what he's doing, to learn to live so much in the present of what God is doing and trusting him with the future that you start to see that our God, he cares, he's able, and he's purposeful. But sometimes we never put ourselves into a position to be able to get there. Now let me finish just with this. Remember I said earlier I struggle with this? I was asking the Lord, like, where do I struggle the most? I struggle with my kids. I struggle because I've done a bad job parenting probably. But that's a different issue. I struggle with my wife. I struggle with what tomorrow will look like for them. I struggle with questions of will I be able to provide for them? What will happen to my kids? The interesting thing that's happened kind of in this last week for me, and I'm so thankful he's done it, is 
I've had to repent of that. I don't know what tomorrow brings for my kids. I don't know if my kids will be followers of Jesus. There's many of you in here that have done a phenomenal job raising your kiddos, but they didn't follow Jesus. There's other of you that have done a terrible job raising your kiddos, and they've chosen to follow Jesus. I can't control those things, but I can be faithful today. Gosh, it slowed me down. I hate wrestling. But man, yesterday I got to go to my son's wrestling match. Don't tell him that. He's not here right now. But he and I were just present. I watched a bunch of guys rolling around on a mat. Not fun for me. (laughs) But my son and I were just together. Jesus is just to the Holy Spirit just going, don't worry about tomorrow's preaching. Yeah, but God, I haven't figured it out in my head yet. Some of you are sitting out there going, that ain't a lie. Just be faithful today. Be present. So I'm going to bring the band up. They're going to come up. But before they come up, before we leave here, and we're all just kind of sitting here basking, hopefully, just in the goodness and greatness of God. Be present today. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. Just be faithful. And all God's people said, Father, would you please, through the power of your Holy Spirit, enable us not just today, but Father, then tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to be a group of people that learn the joy of your good lordship over all things. Oh, Father, I'm so glad in that passage you didn't say, oh, ye of no faith. <laughs> oh, we do have little faith. Would you grow our faith in you? Would we learn, Father, in new ways how caring you are? Would we learn in new ways oh, just the reality that you are able, you are unlimited in your capacity? And would we learn anew and afresh just the joy of knowing that you have purpose in everything of transforming us in the image of your son, Jesus. I ask all these things knowing that only you can transform lives. And so, Father, would you right now through the power of your Holy Spirit not allow us just to forget it on the way across the parking lot, but cement these truths into our mind that we might live your kingdom, and your righteousness in our week this week. In your precious name, amen. Now let me, let me say this real quickly. I don't know how many in here don't know who Jesus is, but I just want you to know this. You can get off the crazy train of this life. See, everything that I was talking about isn't just for us as followers of Jesus. Jesus is beckoning you to come and to take his yoke upon you. I'm not saying that it's not going to be hard and difficult. I'm not saying that the path isn't going to be narrow and hard, that the the gate is not going to be narrow. But wouldn't you rather walk with it with the one who is caring, the one who is able, and the one who is purposeful? But you can only come to this one, Jesus, by faith. You can't earn his care and affection. You can't try to to get him to come to you. He's here. My heart would be that you would bend your knee today to that king. Take his yoke upon you. It's easy and it's light. And you would learn the joy by faith of walking with this great king. God bless.